if you will be asked in the bar exam, enumerate what are the duties of the obligor. Class, the obligor is the debtor, the passive subject. Obligi is the creditor, the active subject. Now, so that it will be easy for you to remember and enumerate what are the obligations of the obligor, we group it according to the prestation involved. Okay? So, the first group refers to the obligations of the obligor in a prestation to give. Now, since in a prestation to give, it involves what? Money or other property and under the provisions governing obligations, money is that specific or is it generic? Pag nangutang ka sa akin, binigyan kita ng 50 pesos, okay, nabuo. Do you have the obligation to return the same 50 peso bill? Hindi. Bakit? Kasi, okay, we have to connect this obligation to give to what? That utang is arising from a contract of what? Simple mutuum. And in simple mutuum, what kind of object is involved? Fungible property. And being fungible in relation to this, it cannot be considered as specific. It is generic. Okay? So, we now enumerate what are the obligations of the obligor in a prestation to give a specific thing? The first obligation, the principal obligation, is to deliver the determinate thing. Sample natin. Alam ko sa inyo ngayon, di ba naghihiraman kayo ng notes? Pag nanghiram ka ng notes, ano ang obligation mo? To deliver the notes. The notes, how will you classify? What kind of thing is it? Is it a specific thing or is it a generic thing? Specific thing. So, pag hiniram mong notes, limawa ako, hiniram ka ng notes ko, ibinigay ko sa'yo, okay? So, your primary obligation, because it involves what? A prestation to give. Why? Because there is a thing involved, okay? And that thing that is, in our example, is specific. I am expecting that you will return to me the same notes that I have handed to you. Ayoko na sulat ng ibang tao. Gusto ko yung sulat ko kasi yung sulat ko pangit. Ayoko na maganda sulat. Ay hindi ko tatanggapin yung notes sa ibang tao. Because what is involved is a specific thing. So in that example, it involves a prestation to deliver a specific thing. And the first obligation of the obligor, the one who borrowed the notes from me, is to deliver a determinate thing. A determinate or specific thing. Okay? What are the other accessory obligations? Number one, to preserve the thing. And in preserving the thing, this is where the due diligence of a good family is required. But is that an absolute rule, class? No, it is a general rule. Because not all kinds of obligations would only require the due diligence of a good father of the family. There are exceptions. There are cases wherein, for example, in common carriers, the obligation of common carriers in the delivery of goods under Article 1733, the required diligence is extraordinary diligence. Okay? Under Article 1755, the kind of diligence required is at most diligence that is beyond the extraordinary diligence because we're talking here of the safety of the passengers. Now, when it comes to innkeepers, this is what? Under necessary deposit class. Article 2000, it is not only the diligence of a good father of the family. 
So one accessory obligation of an obligor in a prestation to give a specific thing is to preserve the thing which involves the diligence of a good father of the family. So going back to our example a while ago, pag nanghiram ka ng notes, ano dapat mong gawin? Pwede mo bang itiklop yan, kagaya ng ginagawa ng mga lalaki dito, di ba? Pag may notebook kayo, tinitiklop ang notebook, saan inilalagay? Sa bulsa. Hindi ko maintindihan, bakit sa bulsa inilalagay ang notebook? Ang bulsa ay para sa pera, <laughs> hindi para sa notebook. Pwede nyo bang ilagay sa bulsa nyo yung notes na hiniram nyo? Ano ang mangyayari pag itiniklop nyo at inilagay nyo sa bulsa nyo? May possibility na masira. And therefore, the creditor or oblige he has a right to demand for damages. Because in that example, aside from your obligation to return the same notes, okay, which is the principal obligation, you have the obligation to observe the diligence of a good father of the family. But memorize what are the exceptions. Meaning to say, it's not just an ordinary diligence, but extraordinary diligence. And as we have said, if it involves common carriers in relation to the safety of goods, it requires extraordinary diligence. It, is, it involves, again, common carriers, but in relation to the safety of the passengers, it would require utmost diligence. And in the case of innkeepers, it's more than an ordinary diligence. In the case of necessary deposit. Okay? Question. Can the parties enter into a stipulation in such a way that they can change the required degree of diligence? Kagaya sa halimbawa sa common carrier. Pwede ba kung halimbawa nag-prepare ngayon yung MV Princess? <laughs> Tinanggal yung word na ano, extraordinary at utmost diligence. Ordinary diligence na lang. Kawawa naman kayo kasi ang dami niya ng liability. <laughs> and then you signed into that contract. Will the contract be considered valid and binding? As a general rule class, okay, parties may stipulate when it comes to what? The kind of diligence to be observed. But that is simply, as I've said, a general rule because there are exceptions. And what are the exceptions? Letter A, we have here again in relation to necessary deposit under Article 2003. And another one in relation to common carrier with respect to the safety of the passengers under Article 1757. Why? Because it is the law that it requires that it should be what? extraordinary or at most diligence and parties have no right to change the kind of diligence that should be observed by the obligor as a matter of fact class if you will recall in your torts and damages isn't it in case there is a vehicular accident and then the driver at the time of the accident was uh, there is a finding that uh, he was drunk or he violated traffic rules and regulation, the presumption is against him, isn't it? The presumption is negligence. Now, aside from the observance of the due diligence, what are the other obligations of the obligor when it comes to a prestation to give a specific thing? Delivery of accessions and accessories. So we now go back to your property class. What is the distinction between accession and accessory? Can you see an example of an accession here? An example of an accessory? In my subject in property, I always ask my students, you look at your seatmate. Titigan mo. Kung parang Christmas tree at maraming nakasabi. <laughs> These are accessories. What makes an accessory different from an accession my code for accession is what? A P. A P I. What is A P I class? Anything that is attached, anything that is produced, anything that is incorporated. This refers to accession. 
And regarding the word attach, the criteria there is if there is an attempt to remove it, it will cause injury. Okay? So for the meantime, we go to property so that you will be able to connect it with your obligation, the obligation of the obligor to deliver the accessions and the accessory. Class, I'm handling a battle. Just to show you the distinction between accessory and accession. So, if I would like to drink it, I just remove the cup. Question, the removal of the cup, does it cause injury to the bottle? Does it destroy the bottle? No. As a matter of fact, if I want to change it with another color of a cup, I can do it. Diba? Bakit? Kasi this one, there is no accession. Although it is attached, but if I remove it, it does not cause injury. It will only be an accession if the moment I remove it, it will cause injury. And what is an example of that? I have here an eraser. And how many properties are involved in the eraser? Two. You have the foam and the board. Okay? If I detach it now, what will happen to the eraser? So that means it's very clear that if I attempt to remove the board from the foam, it will cause injury. Here, there is an accession. And relating it to our topic, obligation to deliver the accessions and the accessory. If originally, the obligation is simply what? Deliver the foam. Okay? And nagkataon, merong malikot ang kamay sa bahay, idinikit ang foam sa board para maging eraser. Kaya kung titignan mo, pwedeng ikonekta nyo na kagad sa property, di ba? At ang sabi sa property natin, nagkaroon ng accession, so ang mangyayari, dahil itong foam na to, sa yun na to, kaya may obligation na kong i-deliver yung foam. Yun nga lang, bago ko i-deliver, yung anak ko idinikit sa board at gusto mo niyang gawing eraser. Question! Do you have the right to claim the whole eraser? Will it fall under this obligation to deliver the accession? O i-insist mo, hindi. Sa iyo na yung board, aking lang yung foam. Kasi ang usapan natin, Foam ang i-deliver mo. Specific thing. Yang foam na yan. Yan ang gusto ko. Hindi pwedeng palitan. Will I also have the obligation to deliver also the board that is now attached to the foam? Class, remember in property, if there are two personal properties put together, the identity of each is retained. What kind of accession is this? Is it adjunction, conviction, or specification? This is adjunction. Why? In adjunction, two personal properties are attached together, but the identity is retained. And since the identity is retained, and the removal will cause injury, who will now have a better right over this? What is the principal and what is the accessory? Is it the foam or the board? What is the first rule? In the determination of what is the principal and what is the accessory, rule of, rule of importance. This eraser, which is more important? Is it the foam or the board? Makakapag-erase ka ba ng board lang? Di ba hindi? Pang-erase ng board, ano dapat gamitin? Foam. So according to the first rule, the foam is the principal, the board is the accessory. And connecting it now to our obligation to deliver the accession. So it, even if my only obligation is to deliver the foam since the, co, uh, the board is already attached to it, I have the obligation to deliver to you the entire property. That is the meaning of this. But class, this is an example of an accession involving a personal property. What about an accession involving a real property. What is the accession under real property class? So, sa real property, DFA, ano yung DFA? Accession discreta referring to fruits. DF. Discreta 
F, fruits, A, accession. So, pag dinifa, pina, tinanong sa inyo, what is accession discreta? Recall, DFA, not Department of Foreign Affairs, but discreta fruits accession. So, accession discreta refers to the three fruits. What are the three fruits? You have the natural fruit, the industrial fruit, and the civil fruits. So, again, in relation to this obligation to deliver accessions and accessories, if what will be delivered is an apartment that is for lease, so aside from delivering the apartment, the rentals derived from the apartment will also have to be included. Because rentals are considered as civil fruits. If what will be delivered is what? A lot wherein there are fruit-bearing trees. At nagkataon, ayan na yung bunga, namumulaklak na, may mga bunga na yung ibang parte. So aside from delivering the lot, you also have to include the accessions. And what are the accessions there? The fruit-bearing trees. Halimbawa, bumili ka ng aso. Okay, yung pagdog na yan. Nagkataon is buntis. Kasama ba yung puppies? Pag i-deliver mo, yung, yung aso na binili mo, what does the civil code provide? You deliver the accessions and accessories to the obligee, provided that what? From the time the obligation to deliver arises. Kung nagkaroon ng fruits, at the time the obligation to deliver arises. Ibig sabihin, kung ngayon, o limbawa, sa linggo ko, ako mag-deliver ng binili mong papi and binili mong aso, sa linggo pa talaga dapat ang deliver, yung obligation ko to deliver it is on Sunday, ngayon nang nanganak yung aso, kasama ba yung papi? Hindi. di ba? Kasi ang sabi ng batas, accessories and accessions will be included provided that they are what? They are attached, produced at the time the obligation to deliver arises. Okay? Kasama dito, kalimbawa, bumili ka ng lupa, di ba? Tapos ng kataon pala, yung lupa na yon nagkaroon ng accession through what? Alluvion. At saka isa, avulsion. When you Talk about avulsion, it refers to identifiable portion of a property that is now attached to your property. While alluvion, referring to an identifiable portion, which because of the movement of the water, they are now what? Grouped together and attached to your real property. Okay? These are accessions. Accessories have two meanings in property. Number one, accessory per se refers to an ornament. Kaya nga, di ba, sabi ko sa inyo, tignan nyo ang kaklase nyo, ang katabi mo. At kung may maraming nakalagay dyan, kung yun saan po pwedeng pagtusukan, tinusok-tusukan, and then later on, tanggalin mo yon. Tignan mo kung durugo ang ilong, durugo ang tiyan. Di ba merong nakapasok ngayon minsan pati sa pusod, ano? So, pag tinanggal mo yon, dudugo ba pusod? Hindi. Because that is simply an accessory, an ornament. In accessory, although it is attached, once it is removed, it will not cause injury. Okay? That is the first definition. So, yung mga may headband, may salamin, accessory nyo lang yan. Okay? Yung may mga make-up, accessory yan. Tanggalin nyo ang make-up, ano makikita mo? Humarap ka sa salamin, matatakot ka. <laughs> diba? Accessory lang yan. <laughs> Pero, accession, gaya nga na sabi ko, api, anything that is attached, anything that is produced. Kaya yung second definition ng accessory sa property it is now in relation to one of the properties that is attached to the principal that cannot be detached without causing injury. So, can you get my point, class? The two meanings of accessory. Parang kung ang babae mahilig sa hikaw, tanggalin mo yung hikaw, walang mangyayari sa tenga mo. Sa mga nagsusot ng salamin, tanggalin mo yung salamin, walang mangyayari sa ilong mo. Pero... Tanggalin mo yung lens dyan sa frame ng salamin mo. Anong mangyayari sa salamin mo? 
posibilidad na mabasag. Why? You can identify the frame. You can identify the lens. Two personal properties put together. If there is an attempt to remove one from the other, it will cause injury. Therefore, there is accession in your pair of eyeglasses. And between the lens and the frame, which is the principal and which is the accessory? So that is the second meaning of accessory in property in relation to the thing that is attached. So between the lens and the frame, which is the principal, which is the accessory? The lens is the principal. Because the eyeglasses, they are used for what? To help you see more. Diba? Hindi ka naglalagay ng eyeglasses parang astigan dating. Kaya ka nagsasalamin dahil gusto mong lumiwanag ang paningin mo. Now, if you will notice class, Article 1164 is simply a reiteration of what is the obligation to deliver accessions. Diba? Kasi nga, fruits, DFA, refer to one of the kinds of accession involving a real property. Ito, for information lang, ha, para lang yung isa, ano yung isang klase ng accession sa real property bukod sa DFA? CIA. <laughs> o, sige nga, ano yung CIA? Accession Continua Internal Forces. CIA. DFA. Another kind of accession involving real property, a builder, planter, sower. Okay? Again, that's another accession under real property. Kung halimbawa itong, itong tubig na lagyan ng gatas, may accession ba? It, if it is my obligation to give you a bottle of water, nagkataon na lagyan ng tang, orange juice, pwede ko bang i-separate yung, yung tang sa tubig? Hindi na. Bakit? Because there is an accession that happened. And what accession is it? Confusion. In confusion, it involves two liquids. And unlike a junction, in confusion, the identity of the properties disappeared. So, hindi mo na makikita alin ang tang juice at saka ang tubig. Okay. Specification. Ano ang specification? Example ng specification. Nakadikit sa katawan mo ngayon. Ano yun? Yung tela. Kasi yung tela, originally, galing sa cotton tree. So, yung cotton tree, nag, ano, yung kinuha yung mga, yung fruits mismo, yung cotton, and then, ginawang, we need, ginawang tela, tapos, dinala uli sa sastre, kaya ngayon, may shirt ka na. Through intervention of man, labor, okay, it is now transformed into a different property, specification. So, kung yung tela na yan, naging t-shirt, babagsak yun, mag deliver mo yung buong t-shirt to deliver accessions and accessories. Okay? Punta naman tayo sa prestation to give a generic thing. Yung kanina, specific. Ito, generic. Pag sinabi natin generic, ito yung A, B, C, D. Wala siyang talagang uh, classification. Kasi parating sinasabi, ang madali ano, genus does not perish. Ano ba yan, genus na yan? Go back to your science subject. ba? So, pag sinabi natin generic, hindi mo siya ma-identify, ma-segregate from other property. Kaya siya generic. Kaya nga sinabi natin kanina, pag nanghiram ka ng 50 peso sa akin, ang obligasyon mo is what? To give a generic thing. Kasi hindi kinakailangan, pag ang binigay ko sa'yo is 50 peso bill, dapat yung 50 peso bill na yun, with the same serial number, will have to be returned to me. Hindi. Kasi generic siya. So kahit na tig sa 10 piso, tig 20 pesos, tig 10 centimos, basta maibalik yung total na 50 pesos. So, if you will notice, the principal obligation of the obligor, if it involves a prestation to give a generic thing, is deliver thing of the quality specified. Same quality lang. Quality specified. Which, if you will go back to the classification of properties, we're talking here of a fungible property, isn't it? 
fungible property. The same kind, same quality. Do you have the obligation to deliver the accessory? No. Bakit? Because we're talking here of an indeterminate thing. So, hindi sigurado kung may magkakaroon siya ng accessory o accession. Kaya ang kaliwa, hiniram mo sa akin. Bumili ka ng loto, nanalo. O, pwede ka ba sabihin, o, yung panalo doon, accession yan. Hindi, di ba? <laughs> ang ibabalik mo lang sa akin, yung 50 pesos ko. Yung panalo mo sa loto, wala akong pakialam doon. That is not considered as fruits. Okay, what about in a prestation to do? Just simply perform the act as promised and not substitute it. So, kung nangako ka, nakakanta ka, kakanta ka lang. Huwag <laughs> ka nang sasayaw. Okay? Unless, of course, again, by mutual agreement between the obliger and obligee, but that is more of an exception. And, if, for example, you cannot do it because at that time, you are incapacitated physically. So, you can ask somebody to execute the act but at your expense, at the expense of the obligor. But this will not apply if the qualities of the obligor are considered. So kung halimbawa, ang magagawa ng prestation to do ay Gary Valenciano, hindi po pwedeng kumanta si Gary Valenciano at nagka-sore throat. Hindi naman po pwedeng pakantahin kita <laughs> in of Gary Valenciano. Di ba? Because there, we consider the qualities of Gary Valenciano. It is something that is personal. Pero kung halimbawa, pinto-pintura lang, now the painter is incapacitated, I can ask you to do the job. But at whose expense? At the expense of the obligor. Okay? Prestation not to do. And the principal obligation on better dyan, of course, not to perform the conduct prohibited. Di ba sa labor law, example natin, you might have encountered a case wherein one teacher was terminated because of an illicit relationship and what did the Supreme Court say? Considering that the employer is a parochial school, if you remember that, di ba? That can be a ground for termination. So, in other words, what is the prohibited act there? Obligation not to have an illicit affair. So, once it is performed, now it can be a ground under labor law for termination, dismissal. Now, if better does what has been forbidden, then it has to be undone again at the expense of the debtor. So, Again, let me repeat, if you will be asked in the bar exam, enumerate what are the obligations of the obligor. The first thing that I would recommend you to do is to group them according to what kind of prestation is involved. If it is a prestation to give a specific thing, a prestation to give a generic thing, a prestation to do, or a prestation not to do. Para mas madali nyong ma-recall ano yung specific obligations ng obligor. Is that clear? So basically, if you will notice, the diligence of a good father, the delivery of accessories, accessions, they are only applicable if what is involved is a prestation to give. But the two prestations, they are not applicable. Yung prestation to do and prestation not to do. Is that clear? Okay, we now go to delay. Usually, there is a question regarding delay. But then again, this question, if ever it is asked, it is in relation to an obligation arising from a contract. Now, class, another word for delay under the civil code is mora. And that is failure to perform the obligation in due time. And usually, if it is an obligation arising from a contract, that is, with, during the time specified or agreed upon by the, bar, by the parties. If it is an obligation arising from law, then that is based on what is provided under the law. Example, payment of your income tax. Hindi ba? May specified date kung kailan ang filing ng income tax. Pag hindi ka nag-file, ano mangyayari sa'yo? Patay ka, may penalty ka. 
if you will be, for example, notarizing a deed of absolute sale, there is a period within which to pay the capital gains tax. Hindi na sinasabi ng batas na, oh, you, you, uh, you go to the BIR and haggle with the BIR. Mahirap makipaghagil sa BIR. Pag sinabi, eto batas, within 60 days, pag nanotaryohan na, you have to pay the capital gains tax. Otherwise, you are considered in delay. Okay? Now, what are the different kinds of delay or mora? You have the mora solvendi, mora accipiendi, and compensatio more. So, mora solvendi, delay on the part of the debtor. A mora accipiendi, delay on the part of the creditor. And compensatio more, that means delay on the part of both the creditor and the debtor. Okay, what is the rule regarding delay? General rule, no demand, no delay. Okay, but what are the exceptions? I want you to memorize this. Which means, even if there is no demand, debtor or obligor will still be considered in delay. Number one, if the obligation expressly declares it. So usually, we will be talking here of an obligation arising from a contract. Or the law expressly declares it. So if the obligation or the law expressly declares it. That is why, if you will notice, anybody who is renting an apartment or condo unit here and who has a contract of lease, if you have a contract of lease, when you go home, look at that portion wherein it provides for the payment of the rental. And you will notice that there is a phrase there, rental should be paid on or before the fifth day of each month without demand. That phrase, without demand, is an example of exception number one. If the obligation expressly so declares. So it's also necessary, class, I know that some of you are already being requested by your friends or your relatives to draft a contract. So, for the protection of your relative or the friend that you're helping, if in case it involves a prestation to give, do not forget to insert the phrase without need of demand. Why? Because in relation to delay, okay, the debtor cannot use that as a defense against your relative or friend. Hindi ka naman naniningil eh. Ay, hindi ako nagbabayad. Eh, sabi ng batas, without demand, no demand, no delay. So that you can protect your friend or your relative, you insert that phrase, without need of demand. And that will be under exception number one. Also, under exception number one, if the law expressly so declares, as I mentioned a while ago, the payment of your income tax. When do you pay your income tax? On or before April 15 of every year. Kaya makita mo mga Pilipino, natataranta na pagdating ng April 15th. Without need of demand. Sa pagbabayad ng tuition fee, kailangan bang mag-demand? <laughs> Pwede ba natin sabihin kay Dean Rian, hindi naman ako kayo nagde-demand. Eh sabi ng teacher ko, no demand, no delay. <laughs> diba? I think it is very clear for in all schools for that matter, without need of demand, because the obligation expressly so declares. Now, time-controlling motive for establishment of contract. Time is of the essence. What is an example of this? Kayo, magbabar exam kayo sa September. So, kinakailangan lahat ng lectures matapos on or before the first Sunday of September. Mantakin mo kung yung teacher hindi pa rin tapos. <laughs> Nagbabar exam ka na. Time is of the essence. O halimbawa, yung mga ikakasal. ba? If you decided to rent a car, you don't need to call 
and inform, uy, kailangan dumating ka na rito, tumatagaktak na, natutunaw na yung makeup ng bride, hanggang ngayon di ka pa dumarating. Time is of the essence. O kaya, umorder ka ng cake, di ba? Wedding cake. Pwede bang sabihin ng ano, hindi ka nag-demand, so hindi ko dineliver ang wedding cake. Eh, kaninong wedding mo ibibigay yan? <laughs> Determinate. Yung ano, yung cake, di ba? Specific yun, hindi yun generic. Dahil nandun pa yung mga ano nyo, uh, yung sarili nyo, may kanya-kanyang style ang mga ikakasal eh. This morning, I received one invitation because I, I will be one of the ninangs of my former student-in-law. And his invitation is in the form of a passport. Akala ko, bibigyan ako ng ticket mo. <laughs> passport. Nakakatuwa nga eh. So, ayan na, may idea na kayo. So, dapat din yan din na isang i-aspire nyo. Aside from learning or re recalling all the things that you learned from first year to third year, if you are still negotiable, okay, light moment ulit tayo, try to scout for uh, anybody here who is also negotiable. Diba? At least, pagkatapos ng bar exam, tuloy-tuloy na sa simbahan. <laughs> okay. The third one, demand would be useless. Now, what about in reciprocal obligation? When can a party in a reciprocal obligation be considered in delay? When you say reciprocal obligation, that means that the parties are both debtors and creditors to each other. So, from the moment that one of the parties fulfills its obligation, then it's automatic that there is delay on the part of the other party. Example! Magbe-break na tayo, bibili na kayo ng pagkain nyo, <laughs> di ba? So, usually, anong patakaran dito? Sino una nagdi-deliver? Kayo o sila? Sa inyo, what do you have to deliver? Di ba? Deliver payment. Sila, deliver food. Okay? Pag nag-deliver ka ng payment, Kailangan ba hintayin nilang mag-demand kayo for delivery? Hindi. Magtititigan ba kayong dalawa ng kahera? <laughs> kahera? According to the civil code, no demand, no delay. <laughs> Sabihin mo, this is an obligation arising from a contract and the obligation involved is a reciprocal obligation. And since I already handed to you my money, automatically you are in delay. <laughs> Siguro, pag sinag sinagot mong gano'n yung tindera, baka masampal ka. <laughs> but we are just trying to apply what the provision is telling us. Okay? In case of a reciprocal obligation, the other party will be in delay from the moment one party has already fulfilled his obligation. Is that clear? Other possible question that might be asked in the bar exam has something to do with Fortuitous event. Now, the fortuitous event can be an act of God or it can be an act of man. So, an example of a fortuitous event is the Typhoon Ondoy that happened in the Philippines. An example of an act of man, rallies conducted by a certain group. Okay. Now, what is the relevance of the fortuitous event in relation to the obligation? It might affect the performance of the obligation. And that is the reason why, as a general rule, in case there is a fortuitous event, the obligation is extinguished. So that means debtor is released from his liability, whether it involves a prestation to give or a prestation to do. So what could be the best example that we can give? So as I've said, during the typhoon on Doi, Everybody was surprised when water, especially in Metro Manila, it immediately increased in volume. So if at that time, let us say that Juan de la Cruz had the obligation to deliver the uh, cake, wedding cake. Now, we said a while ago that demand is not necessary for the delivery of the wedding cake because time is of the essence. But can Juan de la Cruz be liable for damages? In case he failed to perform his obligation to give, which is the delivery of the wedding cake, for as long as there is no fault, there is no negligence, no delay on the part of Juan de la Cruz, because of the happening of a fortuitous event, his obligation is extinguished. So this fortuitous event is usually one of the defenses being raised in case there is an action for damages that is filed against the obligor defendant. 
because there is a fortuitous event. But as I've said, it is not an absolute rule that for as long as there is a fortuitous event, the obligation of the obligor is extinguished. Why? Because as enunciated by the Supreme Court in the case of Lassam versus Smith, although this is a very old case, but still, these are the requisites so that the fortuitous event can really be considered as a basis for relieving the defendant or the obligor from any civil liability. And what are these requisites? First, it is independent of the human will. The human will there is referring to the will of the defendant obligor. Okay? Second, it is impossible to foresee. Or even if it can be foreseen, it is something that cannot be avoided. That is what happened to Typhoon Ondoy. Although there was, I think there was already an advice coming from Pag-asa, but even Pag-asa was surprised as to what would be the effect of the typhoon in the Philippines. It is something that cannot be avoided. Okay? Third, because of this fortuitous event, it is impossible for the debtor to fulfill his obligation in a normal way. So, balik tayo sa cake. Kung, nung, kung sa normal way ng delivery ng cake, dapat nasa truck siya, di ba? E dahil nagkaroon ng dagat sa Metro Manila, nasa speedboat yung cake. Because of that fortuitous event, the obligation cannot be performed by the obligor in a normal way. And finally, debtor has no concurrent fault. And when we're talking of the concurrent fault of the debtor, it refers to what? He was not in delay. He was not negligent. Because the presence of any kind of fault on the part of the debtor, even if letters A to C are present, that will not relieve the debtor from any liability just because of a fortuitous event. So I would like you to memorize these requisites. Okay? So here are the exceptions that in spite of the happening of the fortuitous event, debtor can still be held liable. Number one, if there is a law that expressly provides for it, and I would like to call your attention, take a look at Articles 1942. It refers to the liability of a bailey in a contract of commodatum. And the law is very clear that in spite of the happening of the fortuitous event, bailey, can be held liable, okay? Who is the bailey in commodatum? The bailey is the one who is the borrower. The bailor is the lender, okay? Under Article 2001, the thief or the robber in a hotel, again, this falls under necessary deposit. But there is an exception here. If there is the use of arms, okay? That's the time that the hotel, the innkeeper, can be relieved from liability. In case of officious manager, this is in relation to your partnership under Article 2147. Again, in, even if there is fortuitous event, according to the civil code, he cannot be relieved from liability. Letter B, if it is expressly stipulated by the party. So that means this will only be possible if we're talking of an obligation arising from a contract. And that will be your role because as I've said right now, even if you're not yet taking the bar exam, I know that you're already helping your relatives in drafting a contract. So if you are lawyering, let us say, if you will be asked to draft a contract for as long as it is favorable to your <laughs> client, you include this provision that in spite of the happening of the fortuitous event, the obligation of the other party will not be extinguished because that will fall under the second exception that the fortuitous event will not extinguish the obligation of the debtor. Although, of course, if you are lawyering on the other side, that will be unfavorable to you. Now, what you have to do is keep on what? asking for the deletion of that provision. <laughs> and usually, you will notice, this happens if we are talking of a contract of adhesion. Tingnan nyo yung mga kontrata na prepared na, nakalagay yan, na kahit na may fortuitous event, 
obligation will not be extinguished. So, ang gawin mo naman, i-insist mo. Hindi. Always invoke the general rule that if there is fortuitous event, for as long as there is no fault on the part of the debtor, obligation should be extinguished. Okay? Assumption of risk. Take note here, I've cited two cases involving a contract of construction. And take a look at Article 1717 and 1724. Because of course, there's too much risk involved in a construction. So, pag nahulugan ka ng hollow blocks, itinataas yan, ng ano, hindi mo pwede sabihin, uy, humangin ho, nagkaroon ng portuitos event. <laughs> I, I remember, I handled the case, the wall collapsed. And at the time that it collapsed, there was a typhoon. But when I made an ocular inspection, I told the client, you are at fault. First, because there was non-compliance with the easement of intermediate distance when it comes to the planting of trees. Kasi mas na nakadikit ang puno sa pader. Second, there was non-compliance with the easement of drainage of building. Yung alulod, butas na, e eh, nagkataon yung alulod, sakto, yung, yung tubig tumatama sa pader. So that weakened the pader the roots of the trees as well as the rainfall. Although, of course, the collapse of definitely, it was aggravated because of the typhoon. But the typhoon alone did not cause the collapse of the wall. Hence, I told the client, we cannot fight this in court because there is fault on the part of client. Debtor in delay. But remember, class, if for this one, to fall under the exception, you have to remember first the rule regarding delay. General rule, no demand, no delay. Okay? So it does not necessarily follow that if there is failure on the part of the debtor to perform his obligation, he's already in delay. It's a question of an application of what? Analytical thinking first. Titingnan mo, o kahit na may fortuitous event, but then one component is if he is in delay. But the question is, will you apply the general rule or will you apply the exception? Because general rule, no demand, no delay. But there are exceptions that in spite of the fact that there is no demand, he can still be considered in delay. And if he falls under the exception, then the happening of the fortuitous event cannot relieve him from his liability. Okay? Debtor guilty of negligence or fault. Again, ano yung negligence? Sinabi natin, in layman's term, that is katangahan. <laughs> okay. So, kindly memorize this because these are the cases when, in spite of the happening of the fortuitous event, debtor is not relieved from liability. Now, if you will be asked, what are the remedies given to the creditor in case there is a breach of the obligation? Ito, i-group uli natin according to the prestation involved. Okay? So, if it involves a prestation to deliver a specific thing, what is the remedy of the creditor? File an action for specific performance plus damages. Or, file an action for rescission plus damages. So, again, let me repeat. If it involves a prestation to give a specific thing. File an action for specific performance plus damages or file an action for the rescission. So, it's very clear that it is an obligation arising from a contract. Action for rescission of the contract plus damages. If what is involved is a prestation to deliver a generic thing, the civil code is clear. You can ask a third person to act as a substitute. So, you can file an action for substituted performance plus damages. That is under Article 1165, Paragraph 2. If the prestation that is involved is a prestation to do, again, since the code allows it, a third person can perform the obligation to do. So, file an action for substituted performance. Except, as my example a while ago, 
if you ask Gary Valenciano to sing, in which case the qualities of Gary Valenciano are taken into consideration, you cannot file an action for substituted performance because only Gary Valenciano can do it. So what could be the remedy? Action for damages. Okay? Now, yung isa naman, isang remedy, if it was really performed but it was improperly done, you ask the debtor to undo it but at his own expense. So these are the remedies given to the creditor if the prestation involved is a prestation to do. And if it is a prestation or an obligation not to do, so we're talking here of debtor who perform a prohibited act. So one remedy is to file an action for damages. The other remedy is to ask debtor to undo the prohibited act that was done. Again, with damages. So because usually in court, every time that you file an action, you can always ask for damages. Although, of course, in relation to torts and damages, whatever kind of damages you will ask, you have the obligation to prove it. Okay, so it's a question of evidence. So again, let me repeat, if you will be asked by the examiner what are the rights or the remedies given to the creditor, it would be easier if you will group it according to the kind of obligation or prestation involved. Okay? Now, there are other subsidiary remedies. Action subrogatoria. Action pauliana. What is the distinction between Pauliana and Publiciana? And what is the distinction between Subrogatoria and Pauliana? Subrogatoria, subrogation. So that means creditor steps into the shoes of the debtor. Okay? So that refers to what? In case debtor fails or refuses to run after his creditor, so, the creditor of the debtor has the right to file an action subrogatoria. But in whose name will the action be filed? It will still be in the name of the debtor as complainant. Now, what could be the reason why debtor, even if he has collectibles, he does not file an action for a specific performance or for a sum of money? Because debtor knows that at the end of the day, even if he will win in the case, whatever collectibles he will receive, here is the creditor of that debtor running after his collections. So, when the creditor avails of this action subrogatoria, it contemplates a situation that his debtor does not like to run after the creditor of the debtor. Diba? Kasi nga, alam ng, ng, ng debtor niya, Pag nakakolekta ako, dadaan lang yung pera sa kamay ko kasi kukuni naman nitong creditor ko. So what is the remedy given to the creditor? Ang gagawin ng creditor is to file an action in the name of his debtor against the debtor's debtor. That is action subrogatoria. What is action pauliana? When you say action pauliana, this is the remedy given to the creditor to question the validity of contracts entered into by his debtor so that his debtor can what? Keep his property away from being attached. So usually, this will contemplate a situation where in debtor, before the case is finished, he immediately disposes his property. Okay? But this disposal is simply what? Simulated. And his intention why he is disposing his property is that he does not like his creditor to attach his property. So what is now the remedy given to the creditor? If creditor can prove that the disposal of his property is made only to refrain or prevent the creditor from attaching the debtor's property, then the creditor has the right to question the validity of the sale or dispos disposal of the property. And that is Action Pauliana. Action Publiciana is the remedy given 
to the owner for the recovery of the possession of his property. If the one-year period for filing an ejectment case has lapsed, if you will recall that in property, isn't it in property there are also remedies available to the owner for the recovery of possession? One is action interdictal. What will fall under action interdictal? Which is summary in nature. You have forcible entry and unlawful detainer. The period for that is one year. One year from the demand to vacate. But if that one year period has already lapsed, it doesn't mean to say that the owner is not anymore given other remedies. The other remedy is action publishana. So publishana is for the recovery of possession of a property, a real property. While Pauliana is questioning the validity of a contract entered into by his debtor to defraud the creditor. Okay? So do not forget the distinction between Pauliana and Publiciana. And of course, action to declare the nullity of an absolutely simulated contract. When we talk about simulations, there are two kinds of simulation. You have the absolutely simulated contract and the relatively simulated contract. Between these two kinds of contract, the remedy of declaring it null and void will only be available to an absolutely simulated contract. Why? Because in an absolutely simulated contract, parties do not really intend to bind one another. While in a relatively simulated contract, there is really an intention to enter into the contract, but what is reflected in the instrument is not the real intention of the parties. So it's still binding. Therefore, the action to declare it null and void cannot be applicable. Okay?